What is the first film you can remember seeing up on the big screen? Oh God, um, I think it's uh, it must be ET. ET must right. be the first thing I saw. Yeah, which is weird because it, it's it, it's because none of the stories I tell are anything like ET whatsoever. <laughs> They're they're, they're all kind of like sort of seventies style, fairly kind of dark thriller horror movies, which which would, definitely would you, would you say that seeing ET uh, at that age or seeing ET up on the big screen was one of those movies that maybe made you think, yeah, I'm, I want to do this. I want to be a director. Um, I think I think I was too young to 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 get that side of it, but it was definitely the first film that made me really think that I loved I love movies. I mean, I think I was about. I must have been about six when it came out, and um, it kind of got me. It just, it just, it just blew me away. You know, I mean, it was, it was one, it was the first experience I remember of it being film being like a, a phenomenon, because there was so yeah. much about it. You know, the toys, the posters everywhere, the TV spots, you know, the whole, the whole thing basically. Um, and and when I saw it, it was just really magical. And 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 that was what I think that was probably the film that got me hooked on going to the cinema. I think it was probably much later that I sort of realized what a filmmaker actually does. Because I think I think probably up until I was in my early teens, I was just like wanting to probably wanting to be an actor or wanting to be in films and just kind of be in that magical space. And then then when I was a teenager, I suddenly realized that there was a person called the director who was who was involved in actually working with a team to put it all together. And that's when I kind of started getting interesting, interested in that. First of all, uh, welcome everybody. I am here chatting to director Neil West, the director of a short movie called Chimera, which is going to be shown on Saturday, the 21st of September, screen mm. nine in the block, which is between half three and 5 p.m. We've got some wonderful little shorts in there, but I'm really excited to talk to you, Neil, because I thought Chimera is a very, very strong shot. I've already told you that I just, it was entirely my vibe. I'm, I'm a talky talk kind of person when it comes to my movies. So you get a bit of that, but you're also throwing in some, um, some uh, make you think kind of storyline in there as well. But before we get into Chimera, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your journey into filmmaking. And most of all, why the hell would you do it? <laughs> um well yeah well first of all thank you that's that's a very kind thing to hear um yeah i mean I, I i so i mean i've been working in the film industry for quite a few years now and i did um i i made a, a feature in 2015 which was called containment which we were Ooh. we were really fortunate enough to get a, a theatrical release on and that's on netflix at the moment and that was that was a great experience um and i've worked in tv i've obviously i've always done shorts and i always come back to shorts between other projects because i just love i love the medium i think there's so much you can do in a short and and it's just really freeing because you can you can just you know you can i mean i've got my own camera kit and you can just get together with a group of people and put something together without it having to be a long sort of two three year process and and you can experiment a bit more because it's not commercial and that kind of stuff but I um I, I kind of yeah I was I was when I was a teenager my next door neighbor got a camcorder like one of those old kind of high eight camcorders and nice. it, it just kind of started with that we just started we started making stuff every weekend we would just go out and uh, and they were terrible they were like you know they were like we, we were 13 so we would just like go to the park and like do kung fu two minute fights and film that and stuff and it just kind of progressed from there and then we started doing little stories and what have you and and then and then really when I sort of got to 16 17 I started to learn to edit and and um and it and again it was all really sort of it wasn't digital in any way it was literally sort of two VHS cassette recorders and like and a tiny little controller where you sort of pause and play and and it was a really slow laborious process but I just loved it um mm. and I really really um just got into the process uh, of making the films. I think up until about then, I sort of always wanted to be in front of the camera, um, as you kind of do when you when when you sort of when you're young and you think, yeah, it'd be fun be an actor. And then I think probably when I was about 16, I suddenly got obsessed with being behind the camera and just and being a control freak with all of that. So um, there was a there was a group of us that used to make films like on the weekend, and I, I remember studying media and film and and just kind of bunking out of a lot of the classes so that I could go and 
book out the camera and the edit suite for entire days and then the rest of the guys who i'd make the films with would just bring me like bring me food and drink to keep me going whilst i was in there for sort of 10 11 hour sessions and it was it was just I, it was great i absolutely loved it yeah um and, and in answer to the other one why the hell would you do it it's just i think you'd probably get a similar-ish answer from anyone that that's into film which is that it's it just it becomes kind of an obsession so um it's it, you know it's not so much why would you do it it's like it's it's just more that i couldn't not do it i just i i love it i feel i get so much out of it that you know it's not about it's not even about it's about the process of doing it really and then you know seeing people getting people to see it and then getting their reaction that's that's what it all makes it really worthwhile so i just yeah i love the process that's incredible. I like that. I like that. And, and just quickly, um, before we talk about Chimera, um, you mentioned containment there. I, I did wonder, because I have seen containment, I saw it a few years back now, and it wasn't until I was like looking into Chimera and looking into yourself, I was like, oh, holy crap, I've, I've seen that. But oh, wow. I did wonder, have you, have you seen a resurgence in that movie since current recent events in the world? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there was, there was a kind of peak for it, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, there yeah. was kind of like um, I, um, I think I think some I think somehow a, a, an, an illegal copy of it got leaked onto YouTube, and suddenly one of our producers found it, and it it had been watched like over a million times or something like that, and it was it was um, and it was just bonkers, and I I think yeah I I got. I had some. I had a couple of interviews with people around that time, and and I got asked a lot of interesting, strange questions. I think one time someone asked me if I predicted the pandemic, which I found a bit <laughs> alarming. Um, but yeah, I think I think I think inevitably, I think you know um, anything that was around that period. I think people. I, I imagine people were just looking for, you know, I don't, I don't know really. I don't know. I mean, I, I I would. It's probably the last thing I would want to watch during the pandemic. So. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you to anyone that watched it, but uh, I would have. Comp I, I, I expected it to go the other way. I expected the people to see, be like, okay, I'm not watching that. That's the last thing I want to see right now with everything going on. I think it's a it's a funny one because I think during the pandemic, because I found myself doing this as well. But I think yeah. during the pandemic, I wanted to watch that stuff. But right. then coming coming out of the pandemic, when everybody was coming out of it, directors and people in the industry, and that's all that was getting made, I was like, no, I've just lived this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, completely, completely. Yeah. Um, well, I, I remember talking to one person who, who said something similar to what you just said, but which which I think makes complete sense. But then they took it a step further. And I think they said something like, I can't remember who it was now. And they said something like, oh, yeah, I was watching a lot of this stuff around the pandemic because I was looking for like information or sort of, you know, yeah. like advice and sort of things like that. And I was thinking, well, the film, films are the last place you should be looking for that. Films about virus breakouts because they're fiction. They're, 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 don't, yeah. don't take, I think that's when I, I think it was, I can't remember what it was. It may have been Fox News or something where they, they where they asked me about predicting the pandemic. And I was like, I'm, look, it's a film. So uh, I'd 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 love to say I I don't talk don't ask me about you know anything like that talk to a medical professional because <laughs> I don't I don't it's it's just purely fiction but um yeah I think a lot of people were kind of looking for I don't know maybe comfort or something like that in in these things because because it was fiction rather than the reality which was pretty bleak at the time obviously so yeah Chimera the short movie that we're showing which um again I've already said like I, I think it's a brilliant short I want people to go and check this out it's it's visually stunning and tells a great little story to it and um, without telling too much of course where mm. did where did Chimera come from what was the acorn um where did this idea spring from yeah so it was um so the story is written by David Lemon, David Lemon, Lemon, David Lemon, who wrote uh, Containment, and and he and I, after Containment, he and I had been bouncing ideas back and forth for ages, for years, literally after after Containment, trying to come up with another idea for a feature that we really wanted to put together, and and there were lots of different stories that were kind of kind of got merged together to some degree into what eventually became Chimera, and we both love um, 70s thrillers and horror movies that's that's kind of that's our, mm. our our real passion um and we wanted to make something that kind of felt like it existed in that kind of that kind of area um and and again like containment we're both i think we're both quite fans of kind of fairly um <clears throat> fairly contained movies in terms of location so we like the idea of setting this setting this film inside 
um, a facility and having the whole film take place in there. So that although it's although it's kind of got a timestamp where it feels quite sort of retro and and it feels quite seventies, it's a bit anachronistic. So there's some elements which a little bit modern as well. So you're never quite sure where it's set, but it. Um, we, we kind of took that approach with everything, not just the production design, but, you know, we used old 1970s um, Soviet glass for the lenses. Yeah. And we kind of went that way with the grade, with kind of harking back to things like um, Dario Argento movies and stuff like that with this kind of extreme color and contrast. And we did want to make a film that felt like it kind of um, had just been discovered that had been shot sort of like 40, 50 years ago, basically. And, and it was really fun. Um, and also, I mean, it wasn't purely for uh, for uh, uh, the visual reasons, but also because thematically the film, it was always designed to be something that felt like it was from another era. So, you know, a, a lot of the attitudes and the sort of characters are very outdated deliberately. You know, you've got this very sort of patronizing, misogynistic male character, psychiatrist slash doctor who, um, who is sort of chillingly charming and friendly, but there's a slight quality to him that's incredibly creepy. And it all felt, it felt like the sort of the idea of gaslighting and, you know, and um, for the, for the bigger picture we want to tell, which is going to have a predominantly female cast, this kind of sense of growing empowerment. These are all themes that were very relevant now, but also kind of hark back to this period in the seventies and eighties in a very different way, which is something we wanted to, we wanted to explore. And we thought that would be a kind of fun area to sort of play within. We'll, we'll talk about your cast. Um, Andrew Scarborough and uh, Char Charlene Leah, I believe her last name. Leah, yeah. So, how do you, because you need to get this right, because you're dealing with a short movie, you're dealing with quite an intense story. Uh, it's talky yeah. talk back and forth quite a bit. So, you have to get your character, your, your actors right for the characters. How did you go about casting Andrew and Charlene? Well, it, it's funny, actually, Andrew came through our producer, Julie, um, uh, and Julie, Julie is brilliant and she knew Andrew personally uh, and she recommended him. Uh, and I, I already knew of Andrew's work and he's, he's, I mean, he's such a great actor. He's, he's got that, he's got that charisma that, that yeah. you know, that kind of almost Jack Nicholson like charisma where you just can't take your eyes away from him. And he's got the most amazing voice. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could just listen to it. All day long um and he's and I, I love the fact that he's a very f sort of film orientated actor he's very still he's 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 it, the performance is very insular you know it's all sort of going on behind the eyes and it's all internal and um and it's very controlled which was great for that character and yeah so to be honest julie recommended him and he was the first person i saw him and, and we didn't really go any further than that i was once <laughs> I him and we talked about it i was just like yeah you you know you're you're the you're the character so so we'll definitely go for there um, and Charlene was someone that was recommended through um, through another friend of mine, um, an actor, uh, Lucas, Lucas Veschler. And he he knew Charlene and he said, oh, you should really speak to Charlene because she's she's incredible. And she's and mm. she's um, she's done these these films and he sent me links to them. And uh, and again, she was she's just got this great presence on screen. And she, and she's very um, for it's, it's the kind of role that could. I think could easily be overblown and become histrionic in in the way that you know this character who's supposed to be quite a young character and is is going through this extreme kind of um kind of fractured splintered psyche um i can see it being really blown over the top but again she was great because a lot of what was going on within the performance was going on internally and she was able to hold yeah. that energy but not not let it out all the time you know to kind of keep it contained and and that I, I just thought that worked really well with that sense of sort of um tension that the film has to sustain over the over the period uh, and they, and to be honest they were both absolute delights to work with um so it was it was great and you know um as were the other our other two actors lucas was actually the um yeah. the orderly in that and and then you know our other our other doctor as well they, they were just a great it was a great team we were really we were really fortunate, but I think a lot of that was down to Julie as well, because she was really good at putting together um, people that are really good and really engaged, but also people that you want to work with. Because to be honest, it's the kind of industry where that's half the battle, really. You know, if you're going to be yeah. doing long hours and intense work, you want to be working around people that are actually fun and creative and collaborative. And yeah, I, I, we kind of lucked out there. I think I, I think I was very fortunate. And and how 
how collaborative were you with them? Was there a lot of like give and take, or was it just sort of like you kind of you know the character bring what you bring? Uh, you know what, Kevin? It was it was it was great. I was I, I mean, it was a luxury. I don't think I'm going to have every time because we, we we factored in a bit of extra time into the shooting uh, so that I could I could spend quite a bit of time working with the actors. Oh, nice. um, I mean, really, we should have. Sh I mean. If it had been any other, any other project, we'd have had a day less to work on it. But we, I really, it was really important to me that we fo we sort of factor that time into into the shoot so that I I would have time to collaborate with the actors. And actually, you know, I had my interpretations of the characters and the story, but also they they brought a huge amount to it themselves. You know, they both did a huge amount of homework beforehand. And it was great just to have that time to actually talk it through and talk through a scene and maybe play it a couple of different ways and you know tweak it a little bit here and there and uh which was great for me as the editor as well because it gave me loads of op loads of different options in post which was yeah. which was great because it was an it was an editing um a real editing challenge probably one of the hardest things i've, I've edited partly because of the way it's structured um and it was lovely just to have that time to to play about with it on set so yeah i think we had a really nice collaborative experience which is great because i think ultimately that's what you what you all want when you're shooting a film really you know it's it can be terribly frustrating when you just have to kind of which is often the case because of the the fact that it's time and money when you have to sort of barrel through something really really quickly um so yeah yeah we, we it was it was a nice set i think to work on that's great and uh, um, and talking a little bit about your set one of the things that i think is one of the most striking things about your short, the the acting's incredible, the the story's really good, the dialogue's excellent. But I love your use of color in this short. Your vibrant uses of reds, greens, blues, yellows, like absolutely set against like the the fact that we're pretty much in a black room kind of thing with obviously some little bells and whistles in the background, the little yeah. machines, which I absolutely thought the machines were fantastic, by the way. Like it just reminded me of like 20, 2001 kind of thing, uh, Brazil, all oh, that great. kind of thing. But um, what was your process and your thought process and putting together the way you were going to light this and put those colours in there, the vibrancy of it to sort of, like, was there anything that truly inspired you in that way? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was always the intention there. And, and I, I had a great, um, I had such a great time working with my DOP. And, and we talked a lot about colour and... Um, I always wanted it to have this very kind of neon soaked mm. um again slightly retro kind of feel to it almost as if the film was color coded it was quite useful from a structural point of view as well because it was because it was all set in the one space um it was a useful way of kind of um clarifying what sort of where you were in terms of time yes so you know the different the different the different moments happening at different times the different colors and from an editing point of view, it really helped to kind of structure it and put it together just to orientate the audience. Because otherwise, I think it could have been super confusing. Um, you know, we're in, we're in the same time, same place, what? So so that was really good. But I, I do love um, really high contrast, bold colors. I mean, you know, a lot of the, the films which we were drawing upon, you know, films like uh, Suspiria, Dario Argento's film, which again, uses that kind of extreme bold red and kind of like sort of neon blue and green um i love that because i think it just it gives it a slightly otherworldly aspect as well so it, it was strange the space we shot in was actually a um uh, a theater quite a small theater and it, did, it wasn't a huge space but I, I remember the first conversation i had with the dop was i said what i want to do is i want to i want to kind of try and I, i'm not sure if we completely succeeded with this but um i wanted to try and create kind of a void a bit like you get in sort of something like under the skin where you were never really completely sure how far back the walls yes. went and so the lights which would kind of form this kind of um framework or barrier around the space to kind of delineate this small area was to kind of um, keep you orientated, but at the same time, it was it was very high contrast. So the the darkness of the walls hopefully would just slip into the background, and you'd you'd never be quite sure where you were or whether it was a big space or a small space. Yeah. Um, and and that, yeah, that was part of the that was part of the of the fun of it as well. And just to kind of essentially, we we were creating the set with light, so it wasn't it was very minimal production design. You know, like we did have the the weird sort of um, sparkly. Uh, machine in the background and we had like the uh the tape the old-fashioned tape recorder on the trolley but that was pretty much it apart from a couple of chairs it was all yeah the production design was the lights in many ways 
I love that, and and of course it all it all accentuates the score as well because your your score on this thing is is gorgeous. Just like even just the littlest sounds, everything that has its place and it and it just works so well. That was one of the things I wanted to point out as well. Oh, thank well, you. Yeah, well, well, Graham Graham Hadfield, who did the he did both the score and the um, sound design. Is, is is just a, he's a genius and um oh yeah and and again we talked a lot about that a bit like using the the sort of old-fashioned you know the authentic sort of 60s lenses we wanted i said to him you know i wanted to create a soundtrack which felt like it come from the period so we were we were referencing soundtracks we love like john carpenter soundtracks and i said mm. you know and the great thing is like all these you get such um true to life um, digital versions of all, all the classic synthesizers that you know he was able to essentially do it on like a Prophet Five or like a or like an old or, or you know whatever you know, an old Oberheim synthesizer essentially within his thing. So you know it was that sort of Stranger Things type thing as well of getting that authentic sound. So it sounds like the score is is a um, it was recorded on an old 1970s synthesizer. But at the same time, the sound design was really important because, I mean, that's my favorite, I have to say, that's my favorite area of filmmaking sound design. I think it's just, it's the area where there's the most scope to sort of experiment in ways that hasn't been done before. People like, you know, like Mika Levy from um, Under the Skin or David Lynch, you know, their soundscapes are just astonishing. And, and, and Graham and I talked a lot about the way that the sound design and the music would kind of they kind of merge so sometimes it was sound design sometimes music and sometimes you couldn't really tell which yeah, you were listening yeah. to and that was a big part of creating the atmosphere and the sort of that sense of the world that they're in so yeah that was that was great i, I love that that's probably my favorite part of the whole process to be honest <laughs> well well on that um are, are there what, what is the is there any one moment within chimera that when you see it up on the big screen like any director actor creative can tell me what is wrong with their movie. They'll tell me everything that's wrong with it. And I don't like to hear those things. I like to ask what you think was absolutely spot on perfect. Something you see up on the screen and you just think to yourself, you know what, that was a technical ball ache, but it looks amazing. Just something you're really proud of. Oh gosh. Um, I think, I'm, I'm, I really, I really it's, it's gonna be hard to explain why, but I really like the final scene and i think largely it's it's two things it's the way we approached it visually but it's also the performance so i, I don't want to give obviously too much away but in in the final scene where we kind of join these characters again at the beginning of a session mm -hmm. um i shot it profile with them because i wanted to create a, a, a slight sense of distance so you couldn't really see both the eyes of the character and it felt like certainly for the doctor that there was something being hidden but the thing I love about it is the performance. There's 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 a moment. There's the kind of moment that I love in films, which um, I, I think sometimes it's very easy to be frightened to do because it, 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 you kind of sometimes worry that the audience just won't engage with it. But there's there's a, there's a long section at the beginning of that scene of just silence of these two characters eyeballing each other, and the sound design is playing underneath it and just yep. kind of building the sense of tension. And no one is saying anything. And it, it almost feels like it goes on for slightly too long, but deliberately. And I mm -hmm. love that. And I think a lot of that is down to the performance and also that sense of it's the first time they're a profile. And we had we had their face at the front of the at the front of the shot in profile, so that there's a lot of kind of almost negative space behind them. So again, it makes you feel really trapped. Um and that sequence I love to watch just because that combination of sound and performance and the way we shot it, I'm just I'm really glad it came out. It came out just as I was hoping it would come out, but it was um, it was one of those things that at the time I was thinking, uh, is it a risk? You know, is it just going to feel boring? Like nothing's happening? But um, yeah. but I love those moments. I love those kind of long, awkward silences in particularly in horror and thrillers. You know, I think they 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 that's where the I love that more than when people are sort of talking, and, yeah. and I, I love I love moments of silence where you can just sort of build in what's going on with the characters and build the tension. I know what you mean, and and when it comes to the the horror genre, um, James mm. James Wan does that quite a lot, and so mm, it just like yeah. it leaves you wondering what the hell is going on, and what am I supposed to be looking at on this screen? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just yeah. Brilliant. So I know what yeah, you mean. I completely appreciate that. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you What do you hope our audiences take away from Chimera when they see it? Um. I think more than anything, I just hope that they 
that it's 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 a film that's designed to be very experiential. So it's it's just, you know it's it's one of the challenges about it, which is one of the things I, I, I that really drew me to it was the idea that it's it is kind of told almost from the, the kind of perspective of this sort of fractured psyche of the main character. And we wanted to really place the audience in the middle of that so that although what's happening in the film isn't chronological mm -hmm. necessarily because you're jumping back and forth through different time periods, it feels chronological to, to Alice. It feels like it's her way of kind of piecing together this jigsaw in her mind. And I just, I really hope that the audience just, just has that experience and that they, they find that interesting and that they 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 identify with her and they and that they can go away afterwards my idea would be for people to try and piece it together and figure out you know what what the actual chronology of it was yeah. and maybe, and also just answering all the questions i love films that leave it's a i think it's quite hard to do a film where you leave questions open but you make it you give it something definitive that's satisfying so it doesn't just feel like a a cop out because it's very easy for a film to just say oh i'm going to have the ending ambiguous because yeah. That's interesting, but actually, you, you've got to have an ending that feels like an ending and is is satisfying. But it's lovely to have questions left open. So we don't, we don't, we imply a lot, but we don't fully explain. And I, I, I personally, I love movies where I come out and everyone's just debating it and saying, "Oh, I think it's about this," or "I think it's about that," or "I think this happened." And yeah, I kind of hope that it's maybe one of those movies that will get people talking. It's kind of the it's kind of the point of any any good movies to keep the conversation going, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, and I think you'll definitely get that with Chimera. Well, oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. I hope so. I, hope so. I, I just hope people, yeah, people like the ride. And of course, um, it's technically it's a proof of concept. Do we think we're going to be playing in this area again? Are you going to bring us a big feature length version? But yeah, no, I, I hope so. I hope so. Um, we, we certainly, we're certainly working on something. Um, we're working on a much bigger version of it. Um, it's not the Chimera isn't isn't like um, sometimes when people do proof of concepts, they do a scene from within the bigger film. And with this, we wanted it to be its own self-contained yeah. story. But um, the kind of aesthetic and the kind of themes and the and the, the the space is certainly something that we want to go back to and elaborate on and and make even bigger and kind of you know um, and tell the full story essentially. So yeah, we'd love to, and that's what that's what we're aiming to do. I mean, it's obviously early days, but fingers crossed. I did, I did notice that because I was on your website uh, earlier on and I was um, there was like a, a sort of log line of Chimera yeah. and I was sitting there reading it and I'm like, that's not at all what was in the film. What's going on here? So I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I understand absolutely. that now. Yeah, that's the log line for the kind of the feature version. So that's, um, yeah, it's funny. So it's, yeah, it's still on the website because we, we originally started with the feature version and started developing that. And it was through talking to... Um, to a production company that we've been talking to who they actually said because they were interested in the story and they said it's it's interesting but it's kind of an unusual world so they said they were the ones that said i, I think it'd be worthwhile doing a proof of concept first just to kind of yeah. give people a taste of that world so it kind of almost came about as a result of that really so yeah we we sort of but but that was, i i think ultimately that was really good because it gave us an opportunity to sort of play in that arena in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise and we would have been going into the a feature project sort of not blind because we'd have a clear idea of what we wanted to do but we, we we'd sort of it was nice to have an opportunity to experiment with some of that with this. I think that's going to open up a few ideas for us when, when we come to do something bigger which hopefully we will so yeah but yeah I realize that could be confusing on the website <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's amazing no, yeah. I, I really I quite like that I was just sort of like I was sitting there like okay now I'm confused because did I watch that <laughs> but no yeah no, so, exactly. uh, so Neil, we're go we're gonna start wrapping up a little bit, but um, first of all, again, everyone who is watching this, I mean, surely you'll have watched the short beforehand, but if you haven't, just in case, Saturday the twenty first of September, screen nine, uh, the half three till five p.m. block of shorts, some great shorts in there, but absolutely sit down and watch Chimera. I think you're all gonna absolutely love this short, but um. The last question that I have for you before moving away is, um, yeah, we'll go back to the question at the start. We saw how it started. What was the last film that you watched up on the big screen? And juxtapose that with the feeling of the first film. Where is your love of cinema right now? Oh, God, that's a good question. Um, the last film I saw up on the big screen was Civil War, um, oh, no. which I, yeah, which I really, which I loved. Um, I, I, I really love Alex Garland's films. I think they're brilliant. Um, uh, that was 
that was probably the last film I saw. Um, and yeah, it, it's. I think watching films is a very different experience now, you know. But but I do love where where I'm at with it. I remember when I went to film school, one of the things that one of the teachers said to us was, um, "I hope you love film because basically we're going to destroy your love and innocence of going to the cinema." for the first time or perhaps just in the way that you do now uh which which none of us really understood at the time but obviously afterwards you realize that yeah obviously you learn how it to deconstruct it and how it's all, all yeah. done so i think i think i go to cinema with a different perspective now i mean it's really nerdy stuff so it's mm -hmm. like you know you know like like with civil war for example um obviously as a story it's, i thought it was brilliantly told brilliantly shot but I was also um, really fascinated by things like the fact that they shot so much of it on the, the DJI Ronin f to get that kind of war reportage feel. And they used, they used uh, uh, lights lenses, uh, you know, old vintage lenses. And I'm really into lenses. So that I found that all fascinating because there's a real sense of separation in in the shots with that and you know it's kind of like micro contrast a bit you know the cat people just pop and um all the all the technical side of things and the sort of decisions behind that i find fascinating so i kind of i feel like when i watch films now i'm watching them for lots of different things i think first time it's it's kind of always the same you just watch it and you're kind of you get engrossed in the story and you and yeah. you and you, you either like it or you don't and you or you get into it and connect with it but afterwards, when you watch it again, I, I love the fact that there's all these other things that come up, um, which I would never have thought about when I was watching ET. You know, back then it was no. just like, oh, this is this is cool. It's an alien with a long neck and <laughs> you know, and a boy. That's just like that's cool. That's like me and like and I can see myself meeting an alien, and it was just kind of magical because it was it felt real. Whereas now, I kind of love the construct of it and the choices that are made artistically. Yeah. I think I think that's part of the fun, but. Um, I think it probably drives friends I have mad who aren't in film <laughs> when we go to cinema, because when we go out afterwards to talk about it, they just want to talk about just the story or, you know, yeah. the actors or whatever. And I'm just like, I'm just, I'm just waffling on about lots of nerdy stuff that they don't really care about. So <laughs> yeah, that's that, but I don't mind. I love that. A, a way that I um, like to look at it and, and I'm a little bit the same, probably not to the extent of a, a filmmaker or anything, but I like, when I used to go to the cinema, it was for the magic, but now it's kind of like it's for the science. It's sort of like I'm I'm seeing the the how it's done, how it was because I've been on a few film sets now, and it's like you've just kind of destroyed everything because I know it's not actually in space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. I think that yeah, I think that's that's that is the other thing. Although I I don't know, I, I'd be fascinated to hear what other filmmakers say about that because I I. I when I watch a film now, I think if the film is good, mm -hmm. um, I'm still able to suspend disbelief in that way. Like I, I'm, I can kind of watch it and simultaneously be thinking, I wonder how they shot that and why they've shot it this way or this way. But at the same time, I kind of believe that I believe in what's going on. You know, yeah. I'm not kind of, I'm not necessarily always taking a step back and kind of seeing the camera crew behind the camera, you know, and the director kind of off screen at Video Village and all that kind of stuff. I'm still kind of there in the world but yeah. I'm still actively asking questions about the the sort of technical side of it. So it's a weird, it's a weird mixture. It's a weird mixture. But I think, um, I think if it's a good film, it should kind of just pull you in anyway, particularly the first yeah. couple of times you see it. So you're just, you're just there it, believing yeah. everything. Even, even if you know for a fact that it's like obviously completely artificial, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's a good film. It just draws you in and you're like, wow, this is, this is an amazing world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Neil, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you for yeah. submitting your short to Exit 6. Thank you for letting us show it to the world. Show, well, not the world, but the UK. Uh, yeah. Letting us show it up on the big screen. We can't wait to have it up there for you. And, um, yeah, thanks again. First, um, let's just wrap out with how people can find your work, how people can find you. Um, obviously, not your address. That would just be too much. Um, and... <laughs> maybe just one last thing is a little bit of advice for anyone looking to get into the game um well first of all thank you as well thank you for taking the time to chat to, to chat to me it's been great having a chat and thank you obviously to exit six because it's it's um it's brilliant i've known about the festival for ages and it's great to be this is the first time i've been in it so it's lovely to be nice. in it nice. um and yeah in terms of my work i mean um con so containment is on netflix in the uk at the moment and um 
at my website um which is just westfilm.co.uk you can kind of see a bit more about me and and kind of the stuff that i've done um but in terms of uh, in terms of advice i think i think just really the key is it's just to get out there and, and do it i think we, we you know we we we're in we're in a um we're, it's an amazing time for film at the moment because it's so accessible you know people shoot films on their phones people can shoot films on a dslr you can get cinema cameras that are affordable for the first time you know I mean, when I started out, it was like, you know, I had to save up for a long time to buy an old mini, mini DV camera, which cost a couple of thousand. And that was really the only thing I could shoot on it. And it was terrible quality. You know, it was it was S, not not even HD and it was four by three horror box thing. But it was um, it was great to have the freedom to do it. Whereas now there's there's not really the obstacles that, that yeah. they used to be. So I think. I think the biggest obstacle for people usually in terms of starting out is just fear. And it's just like thinking like, oh, I want to wait until I've got something really good. And it's just like, just go out and film, just go and just go and make stuff, yeah. start practicing because it is, there's a huge amount of theory to learn, but at the same time, it's a very sort of practical process. And you'll learn probably more than anything else through the process of doing and actually, you know, experimenting yeah. and seeing what works and then, and then gradually learning why and sort of how you can manipulate situations when you're making a film to, to get what you want. And I think, yeah, that just comes out of just, you know, just grab your phone and go out and with some mates and shoot some stuff and then edit it on camera if you want. Or if not, there's loads of free editing down software you can download and just just start doing it. It's going to be awful to begin with, but that's part of the fun. You know, the, the yeah. first the first films you make are always terrible, but it's the same for everyone. And you just got to keep doing it to learn. So, yeah, I think just getting out there and doing it. Don't 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 wait. Just do it straight away. That's that would be my advice. That's amazing. That's amazing. And again, thank you so much for jumping on and doing this. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm just going to end that there. Thanks, Kev. <laughs>